Hey, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this spinning planet Earth, which is wrapped in a pandemic, which has significant chunks on fire, and which is full of political turbulence, whether in many places around the world, from Brazil to Turkey, and especially in the United States these days, the um, turmoil and divisions and polarization and uncertainty are at extraordinary levels, propelled by the pandemic, the accompanying deep recession, the accompanying social media storm that we're now wrapped in as well. The infodemic has been a subject of this webcast repeatedly, probably 15 times. Mm -hmm. So here we are today, uh, a very special privilege to have uh, Laura Helmuth, an old friend, a longtime science writer, background at, the, at National Geographic, ran the science coverage for the Washington Post. And just this year, in the middle of all this, <laughs> Tumult moved to uh, an incredible helm, the the helm of uh, Scientific American, 175 plus years old now, is uh, in one of the great institutions of science communication, uh, and it's has never endorsed politically a candidate for president. Um, it always been careful, you know. Scientific American historically is pretty conservative in terms of its audience and stuff, and now here they are saying that we've gone beyond the fringe. We're beyond the place of, we're in, we have a new abnormal. We're not in a normal situation anymore. There's a president in office who, uh, as the magazine laid out in the editorial, is so dysfunctional when it comes to key threats that, um, well, Laura can speak to the decision, uh, is endorsing Joe Biden. Uh, we're going to have an hour-long discussion with some great folks who've come in already to the uh, green room. I see Kerry Emanuel, a climate scientist whose work I first wrote about in 1988, and Adam Sobel, uh, Sobel at the uh, at Columbia University here at the Earth Institute, who's um, done really great, great work and important work on hurricane behavior mm -hmm. and changing climate and, uh, and other climate issues. He has a podcast, and you'll hear from him in a minute. Rita, Rita Colwell will be on uh, shortly, who... It has a luminous science career, and also uh, she's at the University of Maryland. She was at the uh, National Science Foundation through both parts of the Clinton and Bush administrations, so she knows how to speak um, and address those issues at the interface of science and policy. And Helen Ingram, who uh, I first interviewed, she was like one of the first social scientists I interviewed about climate change mm -hmm. in 2006. And she's the one who told me, well, you know, People who people go to the ballot based go, go to the voting booth based on things that are soon salient and certain. And I was thinking this is where I was writing about climate change. I thought, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and ever since then, the social sciences have been really important to me. So, Laura, it's great to have you here on Sustain What this Earth Institute experiment. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's it's great to be here. It's great to be talking about these big fundamental issues, um, especially right before the election. It just, everything seems so soon and salient and certain or uncertain. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that kind of year. Uh, so can you just walk uh, folks through this decision? You, you know, change, changing direction after 175 years on something like that is a big deal. So how did that all come about? Yes, we did not make the decision lightly. Um, you know, we... It's been a 175 year tradition that Scientific American has not endorsed a political candidate. Uh, four years ago, we, we had an editorial that very strongly said, um, political leaders need to respect science and not endorse conspiracy theories and misinformation. And Donald Trump does, um, you know, he's rejected expertise, rejected knowledge, shared misinformation. We don't think he's competent. We warned against him back then but we didn't take that final step of saying, therefore vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, but this time, so several months ago, the editorial board met, which is basically just everybody on staff who handles the, the stories. Uh, we met to talk about it and we took the decision very seriously, but we pretty quickly and unanimously agreed that this election is so different. It's such an outlier. You know, the, the Trump administration has been so much worse for science even than we feared four years ago. Um, that we need to just say what we know and and put ourselves out there and say we really think if you care about science and health and the environment and evidence-based policy and reality, um, that there's one clear choice. So that's 
that's how we came to this point. And in, in reading your in, in reading what you wrote, also um, you kind of expressed something that seems again. I guess it's about this moment being so fundamentally different than past politicization politicization issues. Uh, back in two thousand four, I wrote a story, Bush <laughs> versus the laureates, about <laughs> how science became a partisan issue. And here, uh, Marburger, uh, Bush's um, John Marburger, who passed away some years ago, he said, you know, this administration really doesn't like regulation. It believes in markets. Um, so there's always going to be a tilt in an administration like this onto a certain set of actions you get to achieve a policy. In other words, there's you're torquing things. You know, they were changing the summaries of climate yeah. reports and stuff, defending it as being within the bounds of something. But torqued in a direction. And I, I've written, and I'm sure you did, you know, the Obama administration would sometimes torque things too. But what's he, it does seem like now it's different. There's something about Trump has been a, you know, the, he kind of sees himself as the great disruptor in some ways. But is it that aspect of him that pushed this past the limit? Yeah, I think so. And you're right. You know, the, the, the kind of politicization of science, especially hot button issues like climate change, um, stem cell research, you know, those We'd, we'd like to think that we should just go with the evidence and go where the science says, in, including the economics. Um, people who say, you know, there's a business case for ignoring climate change, they're just wrong. They're doing the math wrong. Um, you know, the, the most economic sense is to take it very seriously and, and, and do whatever we can to, to slow down and stop climate change. Um, so those, those issues have always existed. Um, but what's different this time is just the wholesale rejection of expertise um, the sharing of, of just lies and misinformation and conspiracy theories and just making stuff up, which um, you know Trump has done about a whole lot of issues throughout his um, administration. Um, but where you know, in some cases things could be a matter of opinion, but when it comes to science, it's not really a matter of opinion. It's a matter of what's real and what's not. And he's just so consistently de denied reality, um, most catastrophically during the pandemic. And that's that's where we really see the consequences. So uh, I'm going to bring on uh, Carrie and Adam, who are the first okay. folks to join uh, in a minute. Um, but one question immediately, we're now in the instant right? So you've instantly gotten either pummeled or hailed uh, with uh, reactions. Are there some that you see as substantive that you, you want to talk about briefly? Uh, you know, are there challenges to this idea that, uh, you know, or you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so most of the response has been supportive. We've been really heartened. Um, that so many people are saying thank you and that this clarifies some issues for them. And we tried to be very sort of welcoming and inclusive in the endorsement. We never use the word Republican or Democrat. We really just say here are two individuals um, with the hope that people who considered themselves Republicans and maybe are even voting for other Republicans in this election cycle um, will recognize that you know Trump's an outlier. He's, you know, he, he doesn't fit in the traditional political system. And, you know, we, we want people, you know, we want everybody to feel like if they're concerned about science, that they can choose Joe Biden and, and be, be making a good decision. Um, so we, there have been certainly some critiques. I think the kind of the most common and the one that's potentially most, you know, most serious is, are we furthering the politicization of science? Are we furthering polarization? Are we you know, pushing away people who are more conservative or who are Trump voters? And I think, you know, this is like not really a good defense for a schoolyard fight either, but we didn't start it. Um, you know, if Trump had shown just some basic respect for how science works, we wouldn't, may, we might not have felt so compelled to issue this endorsement. Um, but there's, you know, there's been so much rejection of science. And, uh, you know, if, if you want to defend reality, um, it's, it's really not a political stance. It's, you know, there are po political implications, but we're not being political. We're really just looking at the evidence for what the consequences are of this administration and what the hope could be if the Obama, or sorry, huh, if the um, if a Biden administration can bring back some of the, um, you know, some of the respect for science, you know, build back up the federal science force, rejoin international, um, you know, the Paris Climate Accord, uh, be more supportive of the World Health Organization during a global pandemic. You know, all these things make us hope that things can be better under Biden in a in a way that's just really sticking with the evidence. 
Um, there, there is a comment I'm going to post uh, that came in from Facebook. Charles Rotter, who's a, a bit of a provocateur, but he has uh, posted a, something that's worth raising. Uh, who is the the Metatron for this all-knowing science? In other words, um, who sets the bar for where science plays a role in decision making and not? He, it, Metatron, I was looking it up, is a biblical term for sort of an, a, a sage, a big, you know, yeah. the, the decider. Well, we, we certainly aren't claiming that we are, um, we're, but we do have a lot of expertise. I mean, we have uh, a big, well, not big, I'd like it to be bigger. We have a not a huge staff, but everybody on staff has been covering science very closely um, for their whole careers. And so, you know, together we've, we've been paying a lot of attention to this. And um, so when it comes to this endorsement, I think we, you know, we bring to it a lot of knowledge um, and a lot of research. And as far as like when science should inform policy, if you think of science broadly, which, which we do to include you know, economics, technology, social science, political science, you know, if you think of science as just a way of um, looking at and evaluating evidence and testing hypotheses and figuring out what works and what doesn't, um, basically everything should have some element of that when you're making decisions sure. about the future of the country and the world. There was a there was a really great um, commentary. I guess it was Naomi Oreski said posted something on, on CNN a commentary about the uh, damage to the role of science. Um, and someone posted a link to Carl Sagan interview in 1996, where he was talking about his new book, The Demon Haunted World, which is about superstition and science. And he noted that his big uh, that the thing that had happened that year was the Republicans in Congress had abolished the Office of Technology Assessment, which was there to give Congress a, an unbiased view of the basic issues around these technical questions. And that comes to mind to right now for me very a lot. I want to bring in Kerry Emanuel and, and Adam, who are here. We're waiting for Helen Ingram and um, Rita Caldwell. So and we can't, I can't bring you both in without talking about the hurricanes and the dynamics of the climate system itself, too. And then we'll get into this phenomenon with uh, Trump. Um, but and first of all, how are you doing? Kerry, I haven't seen you in years. It, it, you know, we've been like on these weird, this weird journey since 1988, me and you before then on uh, what to do about this and from different perspectives. So how are you doing? Are you in Boston, Cambridge area? Where are you? No, I'm uh, up on the coast of Maine. I've been hiding up here since April, actually. <laughs> so... Uh, as long as one has an internet connection, we're not even allowed to uh, go back to campus. So I uh, might as well be here. But it's nice right. to see you again, Andy, and I hope you're, you've been well. Hanging in there. And Adam, I think you're in Vermont uh, temporarily. Um, can you describe your work? And I'll, then I'll get, get back to Kerry's work and we'll talk about hurricanes. So Adam Sobel from uh, Lamont Doherty and the Earth Institute. Uh, my work. Um my work is on uh, atmospheric uh, dynamics and uh, now a lot on tropical meteorology and especially extreme events, including hurricanes. Carrie was one of my teachers back in the day. Um, oh, I didn't know that. In graduate school. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and we worked together since. And um, uh, yeah, we, uh, my, my colleagues and I do work now on how hurricanes are related to climate and, um, and, uh, trying to assess risks in a sort of concrete and usable way, um, among other uh, more basic scientific questions. So, so having the two of you here, let's just talk briefly about um, extreme events and climate change, and then dive into the extreme event of the Trump administration. Um, what's your take on, well, just briefly on the Atlantic. It's been super active this year, obviously. It feels like 2005, the year my parents in Stewart, Florida, had three hurricanes come over their town. I think that was the first year that where we, they ran out of uh, English language names. Um, what's, you know, stepping back from the moment, what's your sense of what's driving what we're seeing? Uh, maybe Adam oh. and then Kerry. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Kerry. No, no, yeah, teach, teacher first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's very important to remind people that the Atlantic is a pretty special place for hurricanes, um, but it only contains about eleven to twelve percent of the world's tropical cyclone activity. But it gets all the press, 
because the hurricanes that form there affect uh, Caribbean, the U.S., Mexico, and so forth. So um, what we see when we look back through the record is there are all kinds of different influences on Atlantic hurricane activity. It's not really a great bellwether global influences because it's such a small region in the grand scheme of things. But um, there is a uh, 10 to 15 year oscillation um, that is called the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, although it's close, it turns out closer to decadal. There is uh, just random year to year variability always in, in everything. And then we have on a very interesting uh, idea that goes back a decade or so that we had a sort of multi-decadal Atlantic drought which was indirectly probably a consequence of, of sulfate aerosol pollution, man-made pollution. And the <laughs> Clean Air Acts and so forth got rid of that and the hurricanes came back. So the 2005 season and maybe this season, there's sort of an alignment of two or three different positive, you know, accidental alignment of two or three positive influences. When you see globe, look globally, you don't see any trend in numbers. There's a sort of rock solid uh, around 90 a year. Um, but you do see regional uh, oscillations. And then we are beginning to see uh, long-term trends in some global quantities, like the latitude which storms uh, reach their peak intensity. But I'll let Adam take it from there. Yeah, and Adam, you've done a lot of work on what hurricanes do along coastlines or whether some of the dynamics we're seeing can change the odds of a hurricane uh, making landfall, that kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. Um, motivated by Kerry's work in that as well. But I, I want to, in addition to the factors he raised, which is all um, true and important, um, I want to raise one other one, uh, which I think our community is not fully begun to absorb yet, although some of the evidence is out there now in the literature, which is that um, this particular year, uh, one of the factors that's making it active is the state of the equatorial Pacific, which we're now more or less officially in a La Nina state, which is the opposite of El Nino. And El Nino tends to suppress Atlantic hurricanes and La Nina tends to favor them. So that's one of the factors that led has led to forecasts, I mean, accurate forecasts that this would be an active season because um, we saw this La Nina coming. Now, we often interpret that as year to year variability um, that's natural in origin and in fact, um, that's consistent with what most climate models say, because what the climate models have been saying for some years now is that as the planet gets warmer, um, the tropical Pacific would look more and more like an uh, El Nino state on average. In other words, not just year to year, whether it would go up or down, but the whole climate would shift towards a more El Nino like state. And that would tend to suppress Atlantic hurricanes. But there's recent evidence um, from some of my colleagues at Columbia uh, not me, I'm not involved in this work, that actually, um, and it's still controversial, but it suggests that actually the models may be wrong about this and that um, greenhouse gas forcing, I mean, human-induced global warming may drive the Pacific more into what's a, like a La Nina-like state. And the ob observations for the last couple of decades are consistent with that. And that had been viewed as a fluke, but it's starting to look less and less fluky. So if that's all true, it suggests that um, while this La Nina surely has some natural component to it, like all, all of them do, that there might be a force signal there as well. In other words, that the Atlantic, which is special for all the, all the ways Kerry said, um, that the um, coming decades might be more average, more active, sorry, for the Atlantic than we had thought due to um, yet another um, route of human influence. And I'd be curious to hear what Kerry has to say about that. So, yeah, one, one more quick thought on hurricanes, and then we're, I'm going to bring in Rita, who has come into the uh, green room, too. Well, I think, you know, the, the, Adam's absolutely right. They're one of the most important, probably the longest studied climate influence on it is the El Nino, La Nina uh, phenomena. And uh, yes, it's certainly one of the big factors contributing to the fact that it's a busy year. Uh, it's not clear, by the way, whether a permanent La Nina or a permanent El Nino would do the same thing as a transient one. I did some work some years ago with a colleague at Yale to suggest that if you had a permanent El Nino, it wouldn't necessarily suppress Atlantic hurricanes. But this is all very interesting uh, research that's ongoing. 
hold on one second. I have one of our other guests on the line. So um, you may speak. Uh, Laura, do you have a hurricane question as an editor at Science of American? Uh, just, you know, as I'd love to have you guys write about this for us. <laughs> <We> <laughs> <laughs> At Scientific American, we, we publish uh, expert written articles about the most important science, and this is really important. Um, so if you have to, I know during hurricane season especially, you must be deluged um, with all kinds of requests and, and, and doing your own research. But uh, when the time comes to share it with the public, I hope you'll consider writing for us. Thank you. Maybe it will be an occasion for Adam and I to do another collaboration. That'd be super. <laughs> Great. I'm glad we're making that connection. That was Helen Ingram. She's having some technical questions. So, um, I'm, my, I'm the producer, the editor, whatever you want to call it. So uh, always juggling. So let's bring in Rita Colwell, who um, has this very special vantage point on these kinds of questions. Rita. Hi, folks. Sorry. Uh, having tr I had trouble getting in because I'm in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, ah. still with, with my daughter. And the reason I'm here is because they have had one case in the entire province of 900,000 people. How's wow. that? Um, masking and distancing and, ch and testing. It's amazing. And the one case was a student who arrived, I think, from Ontario uh, because they check all the students. They test all the students. And this one chap is now in quarantine in the hospital. So anyway, that's why I'm here in Canada. Uh, Staying with my daughter, who's a physician at uh, Dalhousie University. Well, it's uh, so interesting. What you're describing is kind of a database policy. It sounds like. Meaning it is indeed. There's a risk. There are some clear uh, responses that can work. Uh, you know, with all the questions about masks that were early, there were lots of debates about the initial idea of masks and the specifics of masks. But there's nothing that says a mask is a bad idea. Uh, and, well, and there's good data that the mask does work at least 60%, and it specifically works against um, a micro droplets that carry the virus. I know that um, there is some, I don't know, on, on the internet, there's uh, some chap who is using a vaporizer to show how the vaping uh, right. goes through the mask, but that, that that's inappropriate. Um, uh, smoke does not carry the virus. In any case, there are data, and I think you should argue from the data. And just, I want to remind people about your background. Uh, you, you had done, well, so much groundbreaking work, but the thing that sticks in my mind always, and this relates to public health and, and, and having a good idea and sticking with it, was the work you did on cholera mm -hmm. and uh, very simple interventions that could make a big difference in women in the lives of people in cholera regions, folding sari cloth and, and excluding a pathogen. So when you you speak about these things, it's not like an area you're not familiar with. Well, it, it's not just that we use the sari cloth as a filter. It's backed up with lots of science. Exactly. Um, we did a lot of experiments showing, first of all, that the bacterium is is naturally occurring in the environment. That was 40 years ago, and it was controversial. Uh, now it's in textbooks. And then we showed that uh, the host, it's a, it's a vector-borne uh, bacterium, except the vector swims, doesn't fly. It's a, it's a copepod. And, and again, that was controversial, but now it's in textbooks, and everybody assumes that that's how it happens. But it's the fact that it's predominantly on the on, a, on, a, on its host the part, and in, on particulates, and it's the particulates in the copepods that are filtered out. And work that Richard Cash and other scientists, Richard is at the Harvard School of Public Health, some 50 or 60 years ago, showed that cholera is a dose-dependent disease. In other words, you need a million cells um, uh, in a, let's say, a, a teaspoon of water, just to put it for the lay public, um, to have a really full-blown case. Otherwise, if you just have a few ingest a few, you you just have a single um, diarrheal episode or vomiting and you'll recover. So it, it's it's accumulating the scientific data that then allowed us to have the aha moment. Well, we could just filter out the water that uh, the uh, natives and uh, the uh, um, villagers in the remote areas of Bangladesh use their ponds. And if, they're, if the women collect the water, are taught to filter the water, 
then you can reduce cholera, and that's that's how it how it was done. But I think what's even more exciting, Andy, is that we have done a lot of work on the environmental parameters associated with the disease, the fact that salinity and temperature, and we were able to use satellite. 20 years ago, we had the idea of using when Landsat went up, and we've collaborated with NASA. Uh, you froze. And we do this regularly for um, uh, Yemen uh, in collaboration with the British Aid Agency and UNICEF. But we've taken that model and we've just now been applying it to COVID-19 virus. And we find that the dew point temperature and the air temperature uh, allows us to predict risk of communities uh, for um, uh, if they have two important components, a trigger, that is uh, someone has the virus or it is transmitted zoonotically from the original source, the bat or the, or the pangolin, uh, or there's an individual that's carrying it asymptomatically, but then that triggers and then you have the transmission from person to person. But these can be modeled and um, we've just submitted a paper for publication that's pretty great. So you're still uh, hard at work on these things. Uh, but I want to take you back in time a uh, couple of decades. Yeah, to, to, um, to COVID-19. Well, no, I want to take you back to the Clinton-Bush experience at, at NSF, looking at the, politi the political pressures right now and sort of political... Um, there are, there are those who would say that Trump has actually damaged politics. It's not, it's, not, it's not like politicization, what's happening now. That was, you know, as I was saying at the beginning of the broadcast, under Bush, there was clearly political pressure to adjust words and the like. But what's happening now feels like it's profoundly different. I, I want to be sure I'm not mistaking that. Is, is, does this feel, having experienced that, what, what's your sense of the, the now? I think... Mean the, uh, in under both Clinton and Bush, the Bush administration, there was uh, collaboration, there was um, um, compromise, uh, and I was able to work with both sides of the aisle. The other interesting factor is one of the influential um, persons uh, in Congress for increasing the NSF budget was um, uh, Newt Gingrich. Mm -hmm. he, he is fascinated by science and uh, he's a science techie really. Uh, or science groupie, if you will, um, and a conservative Republican. So it was possible to talk to both sides of the aisle, and I found them to be patriotic, and they cared for the country. Um, and um, they they were able, you could converse with them, and you could come to agreement. And I think we've so polarized that somehow it seems to be unpatriotic to compromise, but that's really how society works. So uh, I think that's that's the um, the unfortunate difference. That that it's just there's a brittleness now. Yes, there's there's a, a lack of communication, a lack of um, understanding that we're all patriotic. We may have different views, but we care about the country, and I think that's what's critical. So Laura. Actually, yeah, Laura, I'm going to eagerly invite you to ask questions of these scientists, too. But at the same time, I want to get a little bit more sense from you of uh, when you hear about the description of the change that, that Rita laid out. Um, it feels like that would reinforce the decision you guys made. But uh, what would and also what are next steps? So just maybe a bit of a reflection of what you've heard so far and then uh, what would have to happen next? Yeah, I mean, I think Rita is exactly right. Um, caring about science and being willing to work together and communicate and respectfully, that should be considered, you know, a patriotic duty. It should be part of public service. And uh, as much as we can, you know, reinforce the return of that norm or establishing that norm, is it, you know, it, it wasn't always universal, of course. Um, but that seems like something that urgently needs to happen. Um, you know, Pew has uh, some really nice research on polarization around science, and uh, it, it just keeps getting worse, where you see people who are 
who identify as more liberal, being much more interested in science and, and thinking that science is important and trusting scientists, respecting scientists and people are conservative being less and less and less so. And so I think, yeah, the big question is how can you take people who, who have been told that science is, you know, ungodly or science is, um, you know, trying to undermine the president, like how do you bring them back and say no that, you know, you heard this message a lot from the president, from his supporters, from your Facebook feeds, but it's literally not true. Um, and that's like a kind of misinformation, it's kind of a meta misinformation. It's, mis you know, it's misinformation about where your information comes from. And I think that's the biggest challenge right now, or will be, you know, as we try to recover from this point. That gets back to the Carl Sagan warning back in 1996 about um, the demon haunted world, you know, when the, there's a breakdown in basic understanding. And this is something I've thought about for a long time. It, it would be better. It feels to me it would be better if people had more of an understanding of how science works than of the findings of science, like a particular finding. When we think about science literacy, we say, what's the structure of DNA or what's a greenhouse gas as opposed to how do we learn mm -hmm. what's real? And I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't mind hearing from Kerry and, and Adam uh, about that aspect of it. Kerry, uh, I forgot to mention earlier that you had been a longtime Republican uh, and a climate scientist, which is not a common thing, uh, from what I understand looking at the literature. And I think you changed parties ultimately, or maybe you're an independent now, I can't remember. Uh, but when you think about this brittleness and you know the work you've done all these decades, what comes to mind too is a is a path forward. Well, I think um, it's very important to understand how people you know and like and or admire who are supporting the current president came to that position because it's very very challenging. I mean, if you you have a cartoon caricature of your uh, Trump supporter or something like that, it's very easy to to paint inaccurate pictures of who they are. I've tried to do that, and it's a struggle. But I think what's going on here is that it's not merely misinformation; uh, it's disinformation. It's a deliberate attempt by all kinds of different organizations, including we recently learned uh, foreign nations or foreign governments using very clever marketing techniques that are aimed at two things. First of all, throwing cold water on the whole scientific enterprise that's making people distrust it. That's the first step. The second step is to make them believe something that just isn't the case. And I think what we fail to appreciate is how far advanced marketing techniques really are and how easy it is to persuade even intelligent people of things that aren't true. And I think it's something for science too. It's something I think scientists ought to tackle, I'm sure some of them are, is how do these disinformation campaigns work and how do you fight them? It isn't obvious to me. No, we've, I've Again, I think I mentioned that we've had at least a dozen episodes of this webcast uh, with scientists and technologists who are really dug in on how does that happen. Uh, Rene DeResta, Stanford Internet Observatory. Um, um, oh, what's her name? Carol Wardle. Um, Claire Wardle. Yeah, yeah, Claire Wardle, sorry. Uh, and they're, they're studying the system. It, to me, and one reason I created, I'm creating this initiative at Columbia is, is I think there's not a sufficient realization that the information environment that we're now we've created around the world this this planetary digital ecosystem is a fundamentally new new aspect of the earth system essentially it definitely has the power to change things for better or worse right um everything from better ag agriculture practices to better responsiveness to hurricanes to disinformation and hate and even violence um, so and there are people who are happily navigating that but it's early days like the World Health Organization, we, we did two sessions on the recent webcast they did on, they did an online two-week two conference on trying to establish a field of infodemiology. Hmm. In other words, can we develop vaccines for, uh, you know, sort of public health for, for information? And it feels to me like an urgent need because so much of what we've seen, I think so much of the brittleness, so much of 
the amplified tribalism is a function of this system that's nascent and not really well understood yet. Um, I want to bring in Helen Ingram. Helen, Thank you. who's Sorry now I'm late in joining you, but I'm finding the conversation absolutely fascinating. I'm thinking uh, that this blogosphere, this great miasma of information we have out there is a lot like the political agenda. And when it gets overcrowded, and there are too many voices, then very important ones drop out. And I think often those voices tend to be the voices of science. Once in a while, extreme events will raise the possibility of opening people's minds and open even uh, concentration within the uh, atmosphere of information uh, to look at things in new ways. And it seems to me that we may be experiencing just that situation now uh, with the fires and the storms. The difficulty with those things are that there are other people, including uh, the Republican Party and President Tr Trump that have been interpreting uh, these events in other ways. The only thing we're able to say is that this may not cause it, but it's a contributing factor. Well, so is uh, leaf litter uh, in the forest a contributing factor. Right. And it is an easy solution, uh, raking the floors of the forest or prescribed burns, and it doesn't look farther to fundamental causes. And I think our present difficulty is not only are we cluttered with way too many issues, uh, with way too many points of view uh, than we can comprehend, but that when we do think about them, there is even science and scientists who will step into that gap and give us an easy solution. For example, I'm a long-term water resources researcher and I have been appalled at the extent to which a dam uh, or a water transfer is the, pro is the answer to every <laughs> water problem. Right. It's an old solution that people know how to do and you fall back on it. But often those kinds of solutions only um, postpone the day of reckoning. And it seems to me right now we have a day of reckoning. But we're, um, I think, vulnerable to uh, being cut down into little tiny pieces. Uh, on the other hand, and I'll just say this, that global climate change as a topic has become extraordinarily politicized. And uh, when things get politicized like this, uh, science has very little voice and science is in danger of uh, being politicized itself. So it seems to me that our best opportunity here is people on local levels uh, responding to these things with the science that fits local things and perhaps the role of nationally prominent scientists, and you all can speak to this, is to connect with colleagues at state and local universities and help them with their explanation about what is going on uh, with tidal surge and sea level rise, what's going on with fires and how they've become so numerous. And, uh, and, and that might be a way to connect. I'm not, uh, I am concerned that we have uh, wasted a good deal of time. Uh, Andy, when we started talking the other day about my participating here, I went back to remember when we met, which uh, was in the early 90s, but uh, it was because I participated in a AAAS uh, book by Paul Wagoner published in 1990, where uh, I wrote a chapter with some colleagues that said for events to be acted on, they have to be uh, certain, soon, and serious. Uh, we certainly have a lot of those elements now, so our opportunity is to interpret them in ways that allow science to speak with an authoritative voice. 
I think if we try to focus too much on the resurrection of the reputation of science, we're going to lose this opportunity. That's so interesting. You're, you're recalling two things for me, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, offer them here. One is the American Geophysical Union, maybe seven years ago, you know, it's 20 or 30,000 Earth and atmospheric and ocean scientists. They started something called Thriving Earth Exchange, which is not a messaging tool. It's not saying, hey, science is great. It's not saying you need to care about science. It was a utility process. You go to Thriving Earth Exchange and you're a, a community chronically flooded along a river in Ohio. And you say, I need help with hydrology. So it's creating a relationship between science and the community in a way that the community feels integrates with their needs. And it's still nascent. It's only, I think they've done 110 projects. They need to do 10,000, right? The scale exactly. issue is enormous. But, and then I, the, one of the women, a woman who helped to run it said to me one day, I asked, well, how do you know it's working? She said, their bigger goal, of course, is to make sure AGU has a good reputation, right? And there was someone, someone in a Republican district, I think it was in Ohio, who wrote a letter to their congressman saying, now I understand what science is. Because <laughs> it's like you helped us with our problem. Not, it's not like, you know, this big institutional thing. And that feels to me promising. Now, on the downside, I want to show you something, which was George Marshall, who's been a longtime climate um, behavior analyst and ac an activist in England. He wrote a book about the human mind and climate. And way back in 2012, he went to an area that I had written about uh, east of Austin, Texas, where fires had ravaged a Bastrop County. He did a bunch of interviews, ended up in his book. And I wrote this piece because it sure, sort of said that when you go through a disaster, that it kind of makes you more of who you already were. Hmm. Like, it's hmm. not like we all suddenly become communitarian. If you're a libertarian going to loner, then you, you just make your house stronger. <laughs> you build bigger barriers. If you're um, if you're a communitarian, then you give money to charities and you, you know, go to the local church. And that was kind of distressing because it says that even in a landscape like the one we have now, you can't necessarily assume that everyone will suddenly jump to the same barricade. And uh, Laura, I wanted to get a sense from you in that context of, again, not so much of the general perception of your the editorial and the the endorsement. But what about members, uh, the people who are part of the community, subscribers, uh, the advisory board and stuff? Are they how are they are they all jumping to the same barricade here, or or, or is there more of a mix there? Uh, yeah, as far as response to our endorsement of Joe Biden over Donald Trump, um, yeah, we've we've seen a lot of support from our advisory board members, from our subscribers. A lot of people say they're going to subscribe, so we'll see. We can we can run the data on that and find out. Um, but yeah, I think you know, historically science has not been the top political issue in any campaign, but I think this, this year and throughout the administration, I mean, we saw very early on in the Trump administration, the March for Science. I mean, you know, it, perhaps as many as a million people around the world marched for science. And a lot of the scientific organizations, you know, Society for Neuroscience, American Geophysical Union, um, American Association for the Advancement of Science, you know, all these groups that had not um, you know, it rarely uh, in, in, been particularly politically active. They all endorsed the march and participated in it and kind of gave it uh, scientific credibility. Um, and, you know, we, we saw people come out with, with you know, hilarious signs or, or angry signs. You know, I think the most common one was there is no planet B. And so right. people were marching in the streets because they felt like science was being attacked. And I think it, you know, it has been, there's been, you know, ab real measurable damage done to the scientific enterprise in, in the U.S. and globally from the Trump administration. And so um, it does seem like that, you know, for the first time or, you know, for the most dramatic time, people are, are really paying attention and really want to do what they can to show their support for science and to, to fix this. And Adam, um, you have a podcast and you're, you're really focusing more and more, like many of the scientists at the Earth Institute on public, um, the public interface, not just with students, not just with colleagues. Uh, what experiences have you had there that might reveal a path forward? You know, Andy, I don't know what the path forward is, but, um, and I'm struggling to find it, but I have a couple things I can say. I mean, I think it's a, a 
it's a challenging issue what you know what, what the relationship of science is to policy and when scientists should take political stances and how they should do so i think that's the you know that's the context here with the scientific american statement so, but i think the current situation is so extreme that it cuts through some of the complexity i mean what we have now as has been said but i'll say it in my own words with the trump administration its supporters is an aggressive rejection, not just of science, but really any commitment to a shared objective reality and substituting for that, you could call it disinformation. I mean, that's a good description, but I would say it's, a, it's an authoritarian attempt to make the facts be whatever uh, you want by a sheer exertion of power rather than a, a, you know, a, a process with rules that everybody agrees to at how you determine what reality is. So, but it's important to say that, you know, you can't oversimplify this. It's not this. I, I don't. One can't say that science can ever determine policy by itself, or that science can be purely objective and free of political concerns. I mean, the historians and philosophers of science have proven that that isn't true. So listen to the science. You know, the science doesn't tell you what you should do. You know, what the right solution to global warming is, or what exactly the right, um, you know, policy about COVID is. It th there has to be some human values there and some political push and pull. Uh, and science itself is a human endeavor. I mean, the, the, we know that values always enter it somehow or other, and there's always a political debate there. But the current situation is outside the spectrum of that. I mean, mm. science works, if and when it works, by a social process where everybody agrees to abide by some practices and principles for obtaining evidence and inferring truth. And instead, we have bald, bad faith attempts to discredit scientists individually and collectively and to misrepresent uh, scientific evidence and reasoning for political purposes. The degree that I haven't seen in my lifetime in the United States, certainly, uh, the historians can tell us whether if you go back and far enough, whether you find anything analogous. So I think, you know, this sort of agita that some people feel about this scientific American thing, I mean, I think that scientists should always do their best to put their political views aside when they're actually in their work, doing their work, drawing conclusions from evidence. I mean, you want to try to be as objective and as dispassionate as possible, but that isn't inconsistent with having principles and speaking in the public sphere as citizens too. Um, and when things go as wrong as they are now, I think at some point uh, we become complicit if we don't speak out. And so some of us feel that we have to put our responsibilities as citizens first and do that. And your question of how to do it, I mean, if I knew I would, you know, I would be doing it, I'm not as, you know, as big a public figure as many are, and I don't have that much clout, but I think, you know, um, and, and, the, and the problem, of course, is that the people who are most likely to listen to us are the people that don't need to hear it anyway. I mean, we have this completely polarized information environment where people live in their own uh, bubbles. And I don't, you know, I don't know what to do about that. But, but I think, you know, many of us have just come to feel that um, silence isn't an option the way it might have been in the past. That sounds like a direct echo of the Magazine's decision. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I get why they did it. I mean, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, Helen, you were going to make a point, I think. Yes. Well, I completely agree with Adam. And it seems to me that in general, it's very dangerous for science to take political positions that are overtly political. But I agree that this is an exceptional circumstances. It's important that science not become like any other interest group. And that is the great danger here. On the other hand, science has been directly attacked. And it seems to me that puts it in a very positive situation. And it's been um, endorsed and espoused by one side of the political argument that looks like it's going to win. Uh, if we are optimistic about that, if indeed Biden does get elected, then the opportunities for science to speak to policy, I think, are enormously great. And Laura, anything, therefore, that promotes that cause is a really worthy uh, endeavor. On the other hand, that having been said, it seems to me that we have to care about where global climate change hits the ground and affects storms and affects fires and affects drought and the other dreadful things that are plaguing the planet. And to affect those decisions, we have to uh, direct ourselves to these particular issues and make certain that the information gets to decision makers in those policy spheres. In addition to that, it seems to me that people in their minds either think this is a Republican and Democratic argument and everybody's just screaming, or they think, no, this is a fire problem and that doesn't have a political tag. 
And if right. they think this is a fire problem with no political tag, they may be willing to listen again uh, to arguments coming from the very same scientists saying the very same thing. So how issues get defined and how they're talked about in the media really matter a lot. And then, and I'm very concerned with fire being connected to a litter problem on the forest floor. That seems to be exactly the wrong kind of framing uh, for this kind of argument. And it's too bad we couldn't have gotten out in front of that a little better and explained uh, the connections uh, to the press before uh, that became the mantra. That and control burning, which has been an answer in the West for almost uh, my entire um, scholarly career, which has been more than 50 years. <laughs> and, you know, right. it can't be used as the explanation uh, for everything, and it can't be at, used as a solution to everything. Well, uh, I think we need to marshal some support for more radical solutions. It, this gets me back to something I've dug in on deeply. And, and I know Adam and, and Kerry, and maybe in the medical public health context, Rita as well. When you have multiple factor issues, in other words, where I, I've described it, climate and, and wildfire, I described as, as like a, it's like a classic Agatha Christie mystery. It's like murder on the Orange Express, where there, there were 12 suspects and they all did it. <laughs> and that I, I posted the other day, I should actually write this as a as an op ed or something. Mm -hmm. The there was a woman who deconstructed Murder on the Orient Express, one of the best selling books of all time, and, and said that the way it worked was that she defied all of our expectations about what a murder mystery should be. Mm -hmm. She designed the book. It fooled us right till the end to think there had to be one suspect. And we, so we all have this predispos these predispositions to, to think yes, no, to think good, bad, to think of the enemy, to think of a fix as opposed to a systemic nature of the problem. Now, I think that could either be a really good thing. Like if, if a problem is complex, then that means everyone can own a part of it, right. whether you're libertarian or liberal. You know you can care about whether your community is going to get hammered or not in a, the next flood. Um, but it also, in, in the rhetorical landscape, it ends up giving everybody a claim. Like if when it's gray, when there's 12 causes, you and you're there to fight the climate fight, you see the climate problem. If you're there to fight the fuel fuel overload fight, setting aside sweeping litter, there's a huge fuel debt and uh, fire debt in the in the West that's coming being manifest now with a trigger with these heat events then you'll find yourself in it too. So I don't know, see, still it feels like, I think there's great opportunity and nuance, and, but we're, you know, this comes back to what you were saying, the, the communication landscape seems to make it worse. Like the way we, I mean, we're talking right now, we're all kind of like-minded in some way or other. I, I would like to widen the landscape here and see how that, how we can get a difficult conversation going and still have something come out of it. I'd, I'd like to give another perspective here. I'd like to say that I think um, uh, we we uh, scientists need to uh, take some blame here. Um, ten years ago, well, nine, almost ten years ago, the Deep Horizon water spill, uh, oil spill occurred, and BP made available $500 million. Um, uh, this was not a fine. It was just a, a BP made this available. They the chief scientist from BP asked if I would called me and asked if I would run a research program. I did that, and in the last ten year, past ten years, we have made a, a very concerted effort to involve all all of the community uh, scientists uh, working on projects. We carried out the program much as the National Science Foundation would do. But we made a very concerted effort to involve uh, the Sea Grant program. This is a community-based um, program that reaches from the scientists to the average individual, the, the watermen, the fishermen, the, the citizens and the communities in the Gulf who were impacted. It's been hugely successful. We produced three documentaries. Um, uh, these were filmed by some very talented uh, filmmakers 
and they've been shown in a number of uh, TV stations and PBS stations. Um, we've had tremendous uh, interaction with the community and we're now summarizing all the work that we've done, making it available in reports to the communities. We're having reports in each state, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, etc. Um, it's been extremely successful. We've involved essentially 5,000 people. We've published, uh, the team has published um, something like 1,500 papers in peer-reviewed journals, including articles in the Scientific American. Um, we've made a very, very strong effort to have this Gulf research program be a citizen program, but still doing excellent science in the best peer-reviewed journals and in um, science um, magazines. And so I think we have to make that effort. And it comes back to the point you made, Andy, uh, the reference I hadn't seen, but I'd like to have it, um, that if you make it local and if you solve the scientific problem, that's a local problem, then science becomes um, understandable. It becomes incorporated into the thinking and the business of the community. And I don't think we've done that. I think there is blame for being elitist and um, being um, um, on a pedestal rather than in the community marketplace. So anyway, that's a perspective I'd like to give. And I think um, we need to take some blame for not all of this, but certainly for the trend setting that's occurred over the last decade. Andy, well, if I could just break in for a second and sure. say that uh, if we're trying to be con uh, controversial, perhaps, and I say this as a Columbia graduate, we spent too much time looking at glo global climate models in the beginning of all this at a time when perhaps we should have been sp spending more time as Rita suggests, connecting events uh, and relating those to climate-related causes instead of trying to spend so much time uh, predicting uh, the climate future, especially since it was so difficult to uh, put that down to particular sectors like water, which turned out has turned out to be very difficult, yeah. and also uh, putting it down to particular areas, uh, which are just too small in the grid. Uh, you know, we've been at this, you know, I, I look at this book on climate change and water, and uh, we're talking about things that happened in the 70s. So we've been at this business more than 50 years. Why is it that we haven't made more progress with it? That's well, I'd love to hear from Adam and, and, and carry briefly on that. I, I have some thoughts. Well, just uh, very quickly, I'm talking to you from, from Maine. Um, and the, in a lobster fishing village, there are lots and lots of Trump tent signs all over the place. But if you talk to the lobster fishermen, they all blame their declining lobster catch and other problems here on global warming. So that's an instance that I think supports some of the comments that we've heard today about the importance of I've been saying for decades that, that all climate change is local. In the end, it's what people uh, perceive. They may not even be right about that, by the way. I'm not sure that the problems in the Gulf of Maine are really attributable to global uh, climate change. They might partially be. But I think it's very important and also to understand the example of the cigarette smoking. The medical establishment had, had proven pretty much that linked to lung cancer in the early 50s. It took 30 years for per capita smoking started to decline in the United States. Have you had conversations with lobstermen along those lines? One of the things that I find, I keep hearing, like here in the Hudson Valley, the river keeper, the Hudson River Keeper, who's a very wonky, I, I use that word genially, I think of myself as a wonk too. He, he's a lawyerly wonky guy. Uh, he teaches at Columbia, Paul Gallet. But he started spending time at fishing and hunting clubs as the river keeper. And he said it was so illuminating. He just, you talk about fishing or hunting or the, the changing landscape, and then you can dive into the more 
complicated issues of what do you do about it. I, is that, have, I, I assume, I bet Adam, I bet you've all had those kinds of conversations in your different contexts. Um, and hopefully uh, we're kind of at the end here. We could go a little bit longer if you guys are able to, but I know everyone has to jump on constant calls. Uh, maybe each each of you have a final thought on uh, like taking the in, the endorsement that Scientific American made or these observations you've all made about broken aspects of what we've done so far. What would be something next week that we at Columbia or at MIT or uh, Scientific American can do to start to flip the script a little bit? Uh, you know, Trump succeeds in a way when we put the lens on him. That's Jay Rosen at New York University has said the worst thing that's happened is the media just transmitting his his daily briefings through those those weeks so as as an automatic response. Um, he wins when he's the story mm -hmm. and he wins on both ends. So is there a way a way forward? So so uh, Adam, I, I had offered you the chance to. Andy, I just, just, I'm going to interrupt and just, yeah. just have to say goodbye. I have to teach a class. So <laughs> Wait, nice what's the, by the way, what's the course? <laughs> Sorry? What's it's the a, course? It's a course on climate physics. Actually, ah, good. For both undergraduates and graduates. So the basics. Starts at 2 o'clock, and I can start a few minutes later. I'll show them my 1988 article featuring you <laughs> about hurricanes <laughs> and a warming world. Uh, so thank you, Thanks. and you can bye -bye. pop off. And it was great that you could come bye, on, Carrie. Carrie, Carrie Thanks. Manuel, nice to see you. Bye. Bye. So, so a quick round, uh, uh, Adam. You know, I think with your podcast and with other things you're doing, you're you're working at that already. Uh, I'd like to help you amplify that stuff for, to whatever extent I can, and I'd like to use this platform to help all of you. You know, widen the conversation. So, so Adam, what would be a next step? Well, thanks. I mean, yeah, I. Um, first of all, I, I think it's I can uh, start by this my short closing comment by um, first of all appreciating and uh, agreeing with Dr. Colwell's um, comment about engaging locally. I think this is a criticism that has been made, you know, from a few quarters of climate science, and it, I think there's some truth to it. It it goes back to the this sort of uh, when the field got serious about treating as a, a, glo a, a physics problem of global climate change and global climate models. And that makes it sort of inevitably gives one less, um, you know, and the models are, are much better at predicting the very largest scales and the smaller scales, but the smaller scales are where people live. So that's a tension that's always been there. And I think um, it's, it's fair that we sh could all find ways to be out there in the community and make our science more usable as with AGU's Thriving Earth Exchange or other ways. And some, for some of us, that may require us to change a little bit what our areas of focus are. Um, so that's not always easy for people with a lot of you know, training and, and, um, and accumulated experience under their uh, belts. But, um, but maybe it's a little easier for younger people um, or some of us are older who are willing to make the effort. But I think the other thing is, just to say really quickly, I think it's partly about mitigation versus adaptation too. Mitigation is a global problem and adaptation is a local one and adaptation used to be considered a dirty word in climate and now we know we have to do it. So mm -hmm. I think that's where you know we're engaging with the community. And just to bring it back to the thing you said, asked about fires and events with multiple causes, I think one way of cutting through that would be if we could all have a little more clarity about what the connection between science and policy is and what we're trying to achieve when we talk about these things. Because if what you're trying to ask is, I'll make it really concrete here. If what you're trying to ask is I'm somewhere in the West Coast and I want to make where I live less susceptible to fire, then reducing carbon emissions is a very long-term and indirect way to do that. And I could probably have a greater impact by doing local things about you know, about forest management, about development, about building codes and zoning and all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, if we're making a, a political argument about what should the United States role in the world be and in climate and how should we engage, you know, uh, you know, what should our pol energy uh, policies be, then the connection to fires is relevant. I mean, we don't have to prove that fires have only one cause. All we have to be convinced of is that increasing fire risk is one of the harms of global warming. So in other words, you know, both, <laughs> which one is more important depends on what you're trying to say. And I think, so I think to answer your question, I think, well, these are things that are already happening, as you've said, but in a university context, we could do more local engagement, more, more work on adaptation and more 
sort of serious thinking on the part of scientists by how and whether and to what extent um, their work is policy relevant or should be and in what ways. We could all just become a little more realistic, and a little more concrete about that, and a little more better educated. Yeah, and I think we're working on that, at least from what I see at Columbia. You know, the climate school is very much that's being planned here. Yeah. Is, is not just teaching more science, climate science, right? It's, it's, a, it's about right. community. The fourth purpose is what can we do outside the walls and, and in sure. meaningful ways. Uh, Rita, do you have a last thought? Uh, hopefully I'll get you back on here. Actually, yeah, all sure. of you are invited to come back as frequently well, as possible. I'm going to be extremely practical and um, suggest uh, along the lines that have just been, uh, words just been spoken, that we as scientists need to be involved in Kiwanis clubs and uh, chambers of commerce and um, local church groups as um, local citizens, not as um, the expert from the bully pulpit, but for, as the guy next door or the gal next door and uh, work um, to convey explanations in terms that are understood by the lay person. And again, not to be uh, condescending, not at all, just the opposite but to be able to convey uh, what science, scientific and engineering and technology, which derive from fundamental science uh, can do and has done to improve the welfare and the well-being of us all in the 21st century. When we think back of all that we have gained uh, compared to perhaps some of the adverse effects that misuse, but when you look at all that has been gained, it's been huge. And this has to be conveyed in a way that's understandable. So yes, um, all politics is local. All science should be local. Uh, Helen, a last quick thought from you out in the Southwest. Yes, we've spent a lot, sure. We've spent a lot of time talking about the public understanding of science. I think we need a better understanding among scientists about how to understand the political realm and how to understand politics and how to act effectively there. And I think, Rita, we've all spoken to that. And I think scientists could spend uh, their time talking to policy scholars and encouraging policy scholars to get involved in climate research. And I'm very excited about this new school at Columbia. I think that's uh, part of the task ahead. Uh, we need scientists who are savvy about politics and policy. So, Laura, uh, the uh, final word to you, who's, who's uh, you know, there was a lot going on this week already, I was thinking about, but your, the editorial, the endorsement clearly uh, crystallized this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I think, so one of the things we've seen during the pandemic is people have increased their capacity so dramatically for understanding the immune system and public health. And all of a sudden the world has a larger vocabulary for things like asymptomatic transmission and r naught, and all these things that were, were really specialized knowledge just at the beginning of the year. And now everybody's talking about them and talking about flattening the curve and understanding what that means. So I think I'm hoping that that capacity and that fascination with the immune system and with you know basic principles of viral transmission, I'm hoping that, that this is kind of a reasonable moment and people will feel a little more engaged in and, and, and curious about how science works and just more sophisticated about it. And I think it, it kind of opens up the potential for, you know, bringing a larger audience in to, to discuss science, to care about it, to learn about it, to ask questions. Um, so, you know, it's, it, this is a terrible time. It's been a terrible year. It's not gonna get better anytime fast. Um, but I think it just shows the urgency of, of everybody kind of being engaged in and, and having a voice in the scientific enterprise. So this has been a great um, moment here this past hour on Sustain What, which is a um, several times a week conversation about how to make information matter on a fast changing planet. Uh, thank you very much, Laura Helmuth, editor in chief of Scientific American, Adam Slobel, colleague here at the Earth Institute, Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Uh, Kerry Emanuel, who has departed here, who I first started learning from in, when I was in my 30s, and I'm not there anymore. Rita Colwell, uh, great to hear from you and that you're still involved so deeply with uh, everything from the deep water response to the COVID, uh, COVID science. Helen Ingram, great to have you here and to reconnect after I quoted you in this story on yelling, yelling fire on a hot planet. 
<laughs> back in 2006. And uh, let's stay in touch on, on your water work too. That'll come up. There's one th thought I'm going to post here as a little quick going away thought. Uh, would we have benefited from an intergovernmental panel on climate risk? Mm. Meaning risk is changing. Risk is a function of the hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. So climate risk is rising. It's risen enormously, mm. way faster actually than climate is changing. And so if you start to have community conversations around climate risk, it feels like a really a, a richer opportunity and it's not a label. It's not like a something you stick here. I believe in climate change. Everyone worries about climate risk. So that would be mm -hmm. one thing to flip the script. And I'm going to just show you a couple of these organizations that I think could help with these things too. We mentioned Thriving Earth Exchange. It's thrivingearthexchange.org. The model is nascent. It's small. Even after six years, I think it's a great model. There's um, Here's a... Epic and here's an organization trying to blur the community university lines. The, the extension service model that was there historically for more than 150 years feels like it's a path forward. In New York, there's a very young organization called Science for New York. They're trying to get scientists to go to city council meetings and to your local borough, borough meetings to be an active participation, a participant, not necessarily to run for office, but you can do that too. But to, uh, you can't change a community's policies without knowing how it works. The, it's an yeah. ecosystem. So uh, they're, I'm a big fan of their work too. And, but I'm really a big fan of all of your work. It's just great to have you here on the show. So everybody, uh, I'll be doing more of these the next, my God, very busy week. Next week is Climate Week. On Monday, I'm talking to the people who run the website, The Conversation, yeah. about scientists and scholars who want to have a voice in public policy. Where do, they, where do you do that? That's one. On Wednesday, we're talking with the guy from Impossible Foods, who, mm -hmm. turning plants into meat. And onward Friday, next Friday, the 25th, the session we'll be looking at with next steps for climate journalism, the Covering Climate Now effort, the Columbia Journalism Review, and the nation has propelled the last year, is going to be assessing, well, where do we go from here <laughs> in, this, in this fiery moment? So thanks again for being here. Uh, wish you all well. Stay safe. Uh, can connect from a distance and ultimately face to face when you can. And um, this is sustain what? Thanks so much. Great to talk. Thanks, to you. Andy. Great to be with Appreciate all of you. It.